October the 30th, 1867, Cleveland, Ohio. Ed Delahanty is born, and the way he enters the world is no mystery. He was the first child of Irish immigrants and a mother who would deliver five more boys in exactly the same fashion. But that's all that was ordinary about Ed. He would become a powerhouse slugger, a major league baseball star who was the Babe Ruth of his time. The way Ed exited this world, however, is a mystery, a century-old puzzle that can never be answered. At the age of 35, his body was pulled from beneath the raging water of Niagara Falls. Did he fall in a terrible misstep while he was drunk and dazed? Or did Ed commit the act his Catholic faith forbade and take his own life? Ed was born to Bridget and James Delahanty, who immigrated to the United States two years before his birth. They settled in Cleveland on Phelps Street in a predominantly Irish neighborhood near the city's Central High School. And in the years that followed, they came to have six sons, James worked a variety of blue-collar jobs to support his family, and Bridget operated a boarding house. To get away from the busy, congested home, the Delahanty boys played baseball in nearby vacant lots, a lot of baseball. And they hung out at a firehouse down the street, especially in the evening when the department's horses were brought out for what was called the eight o'clock call. As a matter of fact, when the baseball scout finally came calling for that six foot one, 175 pound sensation that people were calling Big Ed, people pointed him toward the firehouse and Ed was there. Ed was 19, so technically he wasn't a runaway, though his mother might argue the point. Because the night the scout found him, he didn't go home. He followed the scout to Mansfield, 75 miles away, and signed up with a semi-pro team. When Bridget learned where her son was, she told her husband to go fetch him. But James shook his head. Ed had only ever wanted to play baseball, so they should let him give it a try. He'd be back if it didn't work out. The Delahanty brothers were coming of age at a time when a lot of Irish kids saw baseball as a path to the American dream. Young Irishmen dominated the sport with a reputation for a daring and spontaneous style of play. And Ed was good at it. After a season in the minor leagues, he made it to the show. He was picked up by the Philadelphia Phillies and given a then-record bonus of $1,900. Ed wouldn't be the only one in the family to hear baseball's call. Four of his brothers followed him from Cleveland Sandlots to the major leagues. Ed, Frank, Jim, Joe, and Tom Delahanty became the biggest brother act in the history of the sport, with Ed the family's superstar. Ed had a personality to match his skill. He was flamboyant, cocking his cap to the side of his head, always wearing stiff collars and smoking better cigars and chewing better tobacco than anyone else in the room. Combined with his good looks and unparalleled ability to hammer the ball, he became a crowd favorite. The pitcher Crazy Schmidt was once quoted, When you pitch to Delahanty, you just want to shut your eyes, say a prayer, and chuck the ball. The Lord only knows what will happen after that. The first 14 years of his career were spent in Philadelphia, with the exception of one season in his hometown 
playing with the Cleveland infants. Then, in 1902, he switched to the new American League and the Washington Senators. He led the league in batting, doubles, and home runs. But oh, how he hated Washington. The town was just too quiet and boring for a man who wanted to drink, gamble, and go to horse races. He bore it for a year and was thrilled when he was thrown a lifeline. He was going to be traded to the New York Giants for the 1903 season. He couldn't have been happier. Unfortunately for Ed, a long-standing feud between the National and American Leagues was ending in a truce. It was at a meeting called the Cincinnati Peace Conference. Part of the deal called for canceling all trades and sending league jumpers back to their old teams. And that meant Ed was going to have to stay in Washington. Ed threatened to retire, but he had already accepted a $4,000 advance from the Giants and spent it frittering it away during a trip to New Orleans. So Ed couldn't retire. He was on the verge of personal and financial ruin. He had to return to the Senators. He began the season in debt, and to his mind, he was being banished to a wasteland he didn't want to be in. Adding to his stress, his wife, Noreen, was ill. A back injury benched him for part of the season, and then he was forced to play right field instead of the left field he preferred. His depression grew, and his drinking, already legendary, became harder and more frequent. As the 1903 season wore on, he still managed to compile a batting average of 333, but his team was mired in the basement of the league, even more reason to be miserable. The last straw came at the end of June that year when the Senators began a lengthy road trip. They were playing in Cleveland when Delahanty learned that another player who had made plans to play for the New York Giants, as Ed had, George Davis, was being allowed to go to New York after all despite the truce that had forced Ed to stay in Washington. Big Ed railed at the injustice of it, at one point so despondent that he brandished a knife and chased a teammate through the hotel where they were staying. On June the 25th, during that game against Cleveland, a disgruntled Ed left the ballpark early and disappeared into the city's bars, drowning his sorrows. Nobody knew it then, but that game in Cleveland turned out to be his last. He pulled it together long enough to join the team for the train ride to Detroit and the next series against the Tigers. But Ed was benched for going AWOL in Cleveland. And so he went AWOL a second time, this time leaving Detroit without telling anyone. At 6 p.m. on July the 2nd, he climbed aboard Michigan Central Train Number 6, bound for New York. Delahanty imbibed heavily on the train. The conductor counted at least five whiskeys, and he proved to be more than the train staff could handle. Now, nobody knew who he was on that train. He was just the man who flashed a straight razor at a passenger, the guy who was smoking a cigar in non-smoking areas, the guy who smashed a glass case that contained a fire axe. The conductor had enough. He stopped the train at the bridge in Bridgeburg, Ontario, on the Canadian side. And there he ordered the drunken man off, right at the edge of the slender trestle above the Niagara River and within sight of the lights of Buffalo. Delahanty wasn't even given his baggage. He was warned he was in Canada, so he'd better behave. To that, he reportedly said, I don't care whether I'm in Canada or dead. It was just after midnight, July the 3rd, 1903. 
The train continued across the International Railway Bridge, and after it was gone, Delahanty began his own trip across the 3,600-foot span. But this was a train bridge, not a pedestrian bridge. Sam Kingston, the night watchman on the bridge, saw him attempting to cross and ran after him, ordering him to return to shore. Besides, a boat was approaching, and the bridge's draw had already been opened to make room for it. Ed was undeterred. He tried to push past the guard, and a scuffle ensued. The guard fell to the ground and watched as Ed ran for the other side of the bridge, swallowed by the darkness. The guard couldn't see what happened in the end. He could only hear the splash as Ed plunged in the water 25 feet below. There was no chance of a rescue. The dark and treacherous river was moving inexorably toward the mighty Niagara Falls, 20 miles downstream. The train crew quickly learned that the man that they had put off at the bridge had plummeted into the water. They found his belongings on board. There was a valise containing a season pass to the Washington Baseball Park, made out in the name of Ed Delahanty, and a suitcase that contained clothing and a pair of baseball shoes with Ed's name on them. In 1903, baseball stars were known to their teams and sports fans, but not necessarily to the general public. The name Ed Delahanty didn't mean anything to the train crew, but the clothes he left behind had the name of a tailor inside the coat. The superintendent of the Pullman Car Company wrote to the tailor in Washington, was given Ed's address, then wrote to Ed's wife in Washington to tell her of the incident on the train and that he believed her husband had been drowned. It took a week for the river to give up Ed's body. His naked and mangled remains were pulled from beneath the Horseshoe Falls. He was missing a leg, believed to have been torn off by the propeller of the Maid of the Mist, the tourist boat that has been taking visitors to the spray of the falls for more than a century now. His family traveled to Niagara to identify Ed and begin their own investigation of his death. And a century-long debate of what happened in the final moment of Ed's life began. Some argued it was suicide. Prior to leaving on that final road trip with the senators, Ed had taken out an accident insurance policy on himself, naming his one and only child, a five-year-old daughter, Florence, as the beneficiary. And in Cleveland, before the trip to Detroit, he wrote his wife Nellie saying he hoped the train would jump the tracks and kill him. Worried about his state of mind, Delahanty's mother and one of his brothers even decided to accompany him to Detroit. But Ed's brother Frank and his brother-in-law, E.J. McGuire, told a reporter they did not believe Ed would have committed suicide. They and others thought it was just a tragic accident, that a belligerent and disoriented Ed was simply sprinting for the American side of the bridge, not realizing the bridge had been opened and that there was no surface ahead of him in the dark. Suicide or accident, the family argued that Ed couldn't have done anything to warrant being evicted from the train in the middle of the night with no belongings, no transportation, not even given to the custody of police. Not to mention that the crew knew he was drunk and set him at the foot of a bridge. Ultimately, a court agreed. Ed's widow won a lawsuit against the railroad for their handling of the incident. The lawsuit only had to resolve the question of whether putting Ed off the train in his condition was proper. Nobody had to determine whether what happened after that was suicide or accident. Ed's major league career had lasted 16 years, from 1888 to 1903. 
He recorded a lifetime batting average of 346. That's the fourth best average of all time. He reached 400 in three of those years and was one of the first sluggers who drew crowds to the ballpark on his name alone. He has the unique distinction of being the only player to have won the batting title in both the National League and the American League, an achievement he met playing for the Philadelphia Phillies and the Washington Senators. He was also one of the first players to hit four home runs in a single game, and at one point was the highest paid player in all of baseball. Ed Delahanty was inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame in 1945. Unfortunately, Big Ed's demise has overshadowed his remarkable baseball career. And most folks who bring him up are more likely to want to talk about his mysterious death, the cause of which is still up for debate. Thank you for watching Ohio Mysteries. If you appreciate the effort, please hit the subscribe button down below if you haven't already. Ohio Mysteries also has a podcast with nearly 300 stories in our catalog. Find those on your favorite podcast app or visit ohiomysteries.com for the entire episode list.